The scientific revolution starts now. There are a lot of people who do things because they enjoy doing it. And that's great. But, uh, you know, many things coexist. I wonder, so with science, it's not like programming, where there's not that many people these days that are just in their garage running science experiments. It seems to be mostly something that's done at institutions. And by virtue of being done at institutions, there's this kind of... There's a uniform voice that gets put onto the science that we produce these days, which is that this is the this is the flow of ideas. This is how they will be passed out into the world. And I wonder if you think that the scientific world would benefit from having more independent researchers, or do you think that it's just too confusing that way? An interesting question. Um, certainly. In the 19th century, and even into the early 20th century, independent science was not unusual. Uh, Darwin often uh, expressed gratitude for the fact that he did not belong to an institution. Mm. So, you know, in fact, one of the things I find striking, uh, I often had my students read papers from the 19th century and the early 20th century and tell me you know what they found surprising and, and of course what they found surprising was that the papers were informal mm -hmm. they were conversational they were actually communications among people working on similar problems they were not uh, declarations of the truth. Uh, and that was terribly important. I mean, I would still argue the golden age in physics was the 1920s. We had a vastly smaller community. But where, for example, I mean, you know, peer review is a post World War II phenomenon for the most part. Uh, before that, uh, people expressed their views, other people criticized them, other people checked it. Um, and the greatest freedom, of course, was the freedom to be wrong. And we're now treating it, you know, as sometimes say, uh, science is a funny word, because uh, all you have to do is put the definite article in front of it, and you have the opposite the science and uh unfortunately i you mentioned in our previous conversation your concern with scientism which is what it is i mean that's conflating the science with science yeah, it's interesting there's this commercial aspect that crept into science i don't i don't think that the venerable forefathers of science the people you know, who were coming up with the early astronomy, the early mechanics, early electromagnetism, they were essentially wealthy to begin with, or they were lawyers or doctors or something else. Oh, not really. I mean, you know, people like uh, Faraday and so on were actually poor working people. If Faraday was but, a bit later. I'm thinking of like Huygens and... Oh yeah, Copernicus. Yeah, some of these people. He was um, a priest. I mean, I wouldn't call him independently wealthy, but Copernicus. Yeah, he's an interesting character because he kind of he was very he kept his cards close to his vest. He carried that manuscript around his whole life and only showed it to his friends, and then ended up self publishing it at the end of his life. It was dangerous. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> but what but the... I guess yeah. So my point is just that. Post World War II, you actually have the commercialization, like the publishing industry inserts itself, this peer review ah. idea, um, which a lot of it can be traced back to this character, Robert Maxwell, who decided to commercialize and sell school subscriptions to these Look, journals. I, I remember, I mean, you know, I'm much older than you guys. Uh, Pergamon Press was Maxwell's uh, publishing 
firm. That was a very prominent scientific press. But I, I wouldn't really attribute peer review to his journals. Um, it, it, you know, I can't uh, swear to this, but part of it certainly was that during World War II, a publication and a lot of other things had been suspended. And uh, there were shortages, including paper shortages. And there was a huge backlog of uh, stuff that people wanted to publish. So you needed, uh, you know, some controls over it. And I thought some of the attempts were really very nice. Uh, there's something called the Royal Meteorological Society. The they issue a journal, the Quarterly of the Royal Meteorological Society. Um, they began asking for reviews of their papers. Previously, what happened is each paper submitted was read at a monthly meeting, and the critiques were published with the paper, which was really nice. Uh, after the war, they asked for reviews. But they insisted that there were only, I think, two criteria for rejecting a paper. One was it had an explicit mathematical error. And two, it was not original. Hmm. And otherwise, they said, you, you have to let it go. There'll be criticism if need be in the paper, you know, accompanying the papers, comments in the meetings. But otherwise, uh, continue. Now, for example, in climate, for instance, uh, uh, you know, it's been getting sort of creepy. Uh, so, you know, for instance, there's the American Meteorological Society, which is the professional society of meteorology. In any event, uh, I was, you know, on the council and various times and so on. So, you know, they would take my submission somewhat seriously. I submitted a paper in 2000 uh, questioning whether the alarm uh, over global warming was justified. And it got reviewed and it got published. And the review and the editor was fired immediately. Oh. Uh, the next time, 10 years later, I sent them a paper about what's called the iris effect and had two co-authors from nasa and so on we looked at satellite data tried to see if there was this effect and again it got reviewed pretty extensively and um, got published and again the editor was fired immediately can we unpack that a little bit? Like, who's doing the firing here? What's how's that happening? What are the forces that are working? Uh, the American right Meteorological now? Society uh, hires mm -hmm. the editors of its journals. And what's driving their? Well, they had already committed themselves to supporting the uh, narrative that there was dangerous global warming, which is a peculiar narrative because. When you get down to the crunch, you know, for instance, the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, they have, they have a funny procedure. That they have three working groups, and each of those issues a lengthy report, 1,000 pages. I personally think these reports are intentionally designed not to be read. They don't have an index. Uh, it, uh, these days, of course, with uh, digital copies, you don't need an index. You can do a search. But, you know, it, it's just funny in published material not to have that. But at any rate, so you have one dealing with the science. That's the only report in all the reports from the UN's IPCC that deals with the science. You have a lot of summaries for science policymakers and uh, press releases and so on. Those are political figures. The Working Group One report never speaks of an existential threat. They freely acknowledge that extreme weather would be very difficult to relate to climate. 
And I served on that, so I know it's biased, but there are limits. You, you, you know, you don't want to be, people don't want to say anything too embarrassing. The other two working groups are impacts and mitigation. And they, of course, assume worst-case scenarios and go to town with that. Um, so, you know, a friend of mine, Steve Coonan, you know, mentions that uh, the whole issue is a game of telephone tag, that information gets passed from one to the other to the other, and eventually comes out sounding nothing like the original. But in any event, that said, professional societies, some of which have nothing to do with climate, have nevertheless felt it important to make statements that they agree, mm. that the world is in severe danger, and so on and so forth. Um, and, uh, you know, I can only assume, given what I've seen, that the funding agencies are basically saying, you know, not only do we want people to support the climate narrative, which has been going on since 1990 at least, depending on the agency, different agencies fell into line later. So, for instance, took the Department of Energy almost until the year 2000 to clamp down. But uh, in addition to that, you know, even for fields that have nothing to do with climate or very little to do with climate, you know, the danger that their field will be frowned upon in terms of funding is enough to make them go along. Uh, I, I would say that uh, courage in academia has always been a rare quantity. Maybe I mean, not. I would say that most of the, like, I wanted to just preface our conversation too to some extent and say that you know, we're, we've brought you here to give a different voice to this narrative because almost every single academic that we talk to makes some, you know, tossed off statement about climate change as if it's a foregone conclusion. And so we've given plenty of voice to that side of, uh, but it seems rather under-examined. It's just taken as, a, well, you know, a foregone conclusion, essentially. Well, you know, how shall I put it? Uh, in 1990, I would say 1988, when the issue was first publicized, uh, there was um, all. I want to. I want to ask something about that, sure. Lynn, because haven't there been? I, I remember seeing reports from the 1950s where they were talking about the dangers of climate change. Well, cooling. Uh, in the 1950s, it was cooling. Oh yeah. I see. Okay. <laughs> now, how shall I put it? Hey folks, I hope you're enjoying our conversation today. If you haven't noticed at the Demystify Sci podcast, we really want to explore ideas that are from all over the intellectual map. Ideas we might not even agree with. And that's a really hard thing to fit into the algorithmic system that we all live under. So the best thing you can do if you want to support this podcast is share it with somebody and join our discussion groups. Come over to Discord, come over to Facebook, come over to the comments section and share, subscribe to the channel. If you've already done that and you want to get in even deeper, consider becoming a patron over at patreon.com slash demystify sci you can just give a couple dollars a month to make sure that we can grow this project and make it even more impactful but also you can join the more intimate community we get together once a week face to face you can just join on chat if you want and talk about how this project can be stronger who we should be talking to what we could do better and so i would really love to see you there and it's one of the highlights of my week where i get to sit down with people who can actually look at this show from the outside and see what could make it more powerful. The 50s, there wasn't much alarm. What, what had happened was, if I can recall the timeline of these issues, um, in the late 30s, 38, 39, uh, there was a gentleman in the UK called Calendar, and uh, he had observed that CO2 is increasing, and before that, uh, Arrhenius had, and both of them thought this might result in some warming. I should add that both of them thought that would be beneficial. Um, and in both cases, there were errors that were clear. 
In the case of Calendar, he, 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 of course, was in England, so he presented this to the Royal Meteorological Society, and his paper is accompanied by uh, comments from the two leading figures in the UK pointing out the problems with this paper. And uh, Calendar himself uh, realized that there were problems because uh, from when he issued the paper uh, to the 1970s, uh, this index was showing cooling mm. rather than warming, and despite the very strong increase in CO2. So, you know, this has been tossed around. It was not tossed around as threatening. Uh, the Green Movement changed that a little. And remember the first Earth Day in the 60s and so on. In many ways, you could say it was successful. Although it's often been pointed out that uh, people quite naturally prefer clean air and clean water. And indeed, much of the cleanup occurred before the Green Movement. Nevertheless, uh, you know, many things were instituted. Nixon created the EPA. And there, there were some obvious dangers with that. I mean, essentially, if you could measure it, they could ban it. And mm -hmm. so the better the measurement, the more the bans. <laughs> but uh, Eventually, you know, they look for these organizations never fade away and say we've accomplished our purpose. Uh, they always look for something new. The energy sector uh, is an obvious target. There are a lot of reasons why, but anytime you have something that involves trillions of dollars, at least in today's dollars, um, the temptations to manipulate it are, are very great. The reasons are often suspected that the reason is that there is such a disparity between trillions of dollars and what it takes to influence the political process. What I mean by that is pretty simple. I mean, President Biden, uh, you know, mentioned that uh, in his new, whatever it's called, thing, uh, there's the going to be nine. New Deal? Not, not the Green New Deal. It's the something about uh, inflation reduction, <laughs> or something mm -hmm. like that. Uh, there's going to be nine trillion dollars uh, for climate. Remember, this was a tiny field at one time, you know, even in the 1990. And no one at MIT called themselves a climate scientist. It was too variegated. But at any rate, you know, I, I asked people, if you take 2% of $9 trillion, what do you have? Well, you have on $180 billion. I mean, that buys you a lot of influence to support whatever you're getting what's the two per, what is, what's the two percent that you're calculating though well i'm saying if you're promising to hand out nine trillion let's say you're on the receiving end of that well, of course there'd be many people on the receiving end but let's take it in the aggregate and you took two percent of that that's 180 billion well, 180, you know, look at some of the uh, scandals now with uh, political donations. You know, Bankman Freed gave 100 million. Mm. And that had terrific influence. Uh, other people have given similar amounts. And that buys you a lot of impact on the electoral process. And so are you suggesting that you would take 2% of the money that you get and invest it back into the politicians? That would be a terrific buy. And I it mean, would be I, enough, it would be enough to give 300 more than the market, I think, at that point. It would take, you know, it would give you, allow you to give $300 million a piece to every member of Congress and the Senate. Uh, and so we're looking at like a feedback loop here, essentially? Well, in a sense, a political feedback loop. I mean, you know, this disparity between the trillion dollars 
that it, the government is handing out and the amount of money it takes to influence the political process is so great that anyone on the receiving end of these huge sums would be stupid not to set aside a percent or two or three uh, if it could guarantee the steady flow. Mm, 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 mm. Mm. And there's not really a possibility for somebody to come in and to challenge it because of what you were saying about the way that yeah. scientific societies are set up to prevent any sort of Dissent. questioning of the consensus, dissent from the consensus. Well, I mean, you know, give you an example. I mean, look, as far as I know, my papers are probably still the most read of any of the papers written in my department. On the other hand, uh, I don't need funding. Mm -hmm. Even when I was more active as a theoretician, I didn't need much funding. Uh, PCs are pretty cheap these days. Mm -hmm. uh, students, you know, often had their own support. They had science foundation fellowships or fellowships from other countries. So unlike a person who is involved in experimental work or anything like that, laboratory work, uh, I was cheap. Um, so it, that was part of the reason why I was reasonably invulnerable. Uh, nevertheless, nevertheless, uh, the means of control these days are quite astounding. I mean, I've never joined Facebook, for instance. This is a generational issue. I think people my age just don't understand social media. But I got a link to something on Facebook, and I clicked on it. And the first thing I saw is, you have been permanently banned from Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Classic. Uh, you know, this these new means of control of information are are obviously dangerous and when coupled i mean for instance today with journals i was describing the early period today every editor knows that when he sends a paper out for review he has to include among the reviewers at least one or two gatekeepers and the gatekeepers are people who will automatically reject it, or at least initially. <laughs> they began more insidious processes. Uh, in the early 2000s, it became common. If you wrote a paper that introduced any questioning into the issue, uh, you would get back a review saying, accepted with major revisions. The review itself might take six to eight months to a year to reach you. Then you get this, and this, then you might take it seriously and spend another six months to a year making major revisions, and then they automatically reject it. And the idea here was to impede the possibility that you might send it to another journal and get it through, and so on. But it's become pretty much the case. You, you can't publish in most of the journals. Occasionally, a journal will open up, you know, a, a smaller journal, but it, it will still be part of Springer or something like that. So the, there's something the European Physics Journal uh, published out of Italy. And uh, they were occasionally publishing something that at least was discussing the physics. And uh, that more or less functioned for a, a couple of years. And then recently, they published a paper by four Italian uh, meteorologists who were looking at the statistics of extreme events in Italy. Nothing terribly exciting. Uh, there was no evidence. And it got published, and it was there for a few years. And then suddenly, uh, some of the people in the gatekeeper community read it, started screaming, and insisted that Springer insist that this journal re retract the paper. And the editors caved. And there was nothing wrong with the paper. 
Okay, so physics to me feels like something that is very objective. But if it's possible for a group of people to start yelling for retraction, what do they yell for retraction on the basis of? The physics is wrong, the well, ideas are wrong. Well, in this wrong. case, there was data. And they said uh, th this was not uh, representative data. This uh, was this, that, and the other thing. Turns out most of those claims, as far as I can tell, were absolutely wrong. But it didn't matter. The claims against it were never checked. Mm. So it's enough. It basically, we're in a condition where it's enough to make the claim. And if yeah. there's enough people that are making the claim and there's absolutely. a sufficiently strong lobby, then basically any paper that proposes to challenge consensus would fall. Yeah. I mean, for instance, with this paper on the iris effect. Yeah, can you tell us about the iris effect? I meant to ask you what that was. What that is. Okay. Uh, there are a couple of questions with the picture, the narrative of greenhouse climate control. There are a lot of problems with it. Uh, people hear the earth is warming, okay? And the question is, do they know what that means? What is the metric? Well, I see a lot of times it's average global temperature that people point how, to. Yeah, yeah. How do you take that? Yeah, that's a. I was hoping that you could answer that. Especially in the <laughs> especially in the deep past, right? Yeah. Well, oh. deep past is a second problem. Actually, it, there's an element of that that's simpler. Or not even so deep past, like where the thermometer is very good two hundred years ago, even. No, but, uh, you know, beginning 1870, 1860, you began having records. And in the UK, you had it in the 18th century. The thermometer was available. Uh, but how do you average the Dead Sea with Mount Everest? I mean, that's a fantastic question. I, I, I've, I've, it's a suspicious thing to see written large everywhere. Or even cities with the country. Yeah, like right. You go to you go to the city, and there's blacktop everywhere, and sure. You're like, are you guys? Is this where you? You're, like, where exactly you're measuring this? Because you see okay. these pictures all the time. Of there's a there's a temperature sensor, and it's in a parking lot next to a heat exhaust <laughs> vent. Yeah, no, that that's part of the problem, and it's a temptation. What I find is there are so many problems with this that it's always a tempting thing to attack the problem you've noticed. Mm and support the narrative that there exists such a thing. So mm -hmm. what they do is never average temperature. They realize, the meteorological service realize that that doesn't mean anything. What they do, in fact, is show you the globally average temperature anomaly. And what that is, is you take a 30-year average. I forget, it's 1950 to 80 or something like that. And then at each station, they look at the deviation from that average. Okay? So they have the deviation from the average. They average that, maybe area weighted and so on. And that's what you see without the data points. Now that's very important. All you see is this graph, and it's hovering, doing very little. And then somewhere around 1978, it peaks up, and then it flattens out, but it looks dramatic. It's going up one degree. That's not very dramatic. What What do the data points look like that go into that? I actually have a little paper with a friend, John Christie, on the CO2 Coalition web website, where we show the data points. And it was someone else at Lawrence Livermore Laboratory in 1990 who did the same thing up to that date, so named uh, Roch. It's now dead. But in any event, the data points are spread over a range of 25 degrees centigrade. Mm. And when you plot this uh, global mean anomaly, it looks almost like a flat horizontal line. Uh, what it's telling you is at any given moment, any given year, almost as many stations are cooling as warming. And uh, so what do they do? They throw away the data points, and then they increase the, magnify the scale by a factor of 10. 
And so now what looks like this, flat, is now looking dramatic. And somehow, somehow, and maybe you can explain that to me, people hear the temperature is going to go up another half degree and that's going to bring us to a boil. I, I've often wondered, I mean, who is going to have the patent on how increasing temperature a half degree centigrade will get boiling? They could make a fortune on that. And yet people buy that without, as you say, I mean, take it as for granted, this is dangerous. Well, I think that it's paired with a lot of fear mongering when it comes to the way the data is presented. Like, I don't know if you saw this the other day, but there was a chart. It was in, either in science or nature, and it was a chart of deaths from heat and cold. And yeah. they had magnified the axis for the heat deaths. But not by, for the cold. But not for the cold deaths. And so it looks well, like heat deaths far outstripped cold deaths. Which but in the reality opposite. was manipulation of the axes. You look at the you look at the diagrams that they make of global temperature and the colors are aggravated to make it look like oh, sure. the temperature extremes are much worse than they are because the same map of the same temperatures thirty years ago would have been represented in different colors. And something that I've noticed is that when you see photographs of Earth from the satellite, I swear to God, I think that they're making the Earth look browner than they did 20 years ago. Because you know every single photograph that's posted on the internet is color treated. You know that somebody's sitting there, and yeah. before they, they send it out, they tweak all the levels. And I am absolutely convinced, based off of how brown the Earth is in pictures released by NASA, that there's a very subtle... Be afraid, be very afraid, it's browning, it's dying. Yeah. But we know but that's the opposite the media. is true. But we yeah. know the opposite is true because tree cover is increasing. Yeah, no, no, NASA has published the greenery. And, you know, roughly speaking, since the uh, last 60, 70 years, the arable land and cropland has increased by about 15 to 20 percent. That's played um, that plus fertilizer has made it possible with eight billion people to feed them better than they were ever fed before. Absolutely. I mean, when I was a kid, I mean, and India got independence, had 170 million people, and famine was common, starvation was common. Today, it's 1.2 billion, and they're exporting food. No, we, we've seen some miraculous improvements in life for many people still many billions are without these advances um, and yet we're treating this as a disaster and you have to wonder if there isn't malice behind that that there are people who are unhappy that poor people are beginning to live well that's what i really want to try to understand is exactly what the motivating forces are behind this because obviously for me it pains me just because i have a great deal of I, I love science i love that we can understand nature and that there's a way to go about that so whenever i see it getting somehow corrupted or perverted it bothers me on a bigger scale but in this particular case with climate science I, i'm still a little in the dark like i, I see this feedback loop with the funding but I can't help but think that there's more to it than that, that there's some other forces pushing the Ouija board. We have to finish Look, the iris effect at some point, though. Don't yeah, let's get back to the iris effect anyway, because it's easy to get off track on this. I, th uh, I think that we should get there, but let's do iris effect just be to just finish it so we can move on from it. Okay. <laughs> Keep in mind what you're asking there, because uh, it's obviously a puzzle why this is occurring and uh now with the iris effect one of the things we noticed was the following um i asked the question why are we taking one degree or a half degree as being dangerous and uh the reason for that as best i can tell forgetting the popular media for the moment is that uh, we were beginning since the 1980s to get a good picture or a better picture 
of past climates. So there have been projects studying the last glacial maximum, the glacial cycles of the last 700,000 years, previous things, and the Eocene of 50 million years ago. Now, during the glacial maxima, the temperature difference between the tropics and the pole was about 60 degrees. Today, it's about 40 degrees. I'm using centigrade. And during the Eocene, it was about 20. So you had these big changes in the distribution of temperature over the Earth. In each case, the tropics were almost the same as today. And so you work out, you know, just simple arithmetic, what was the change in this average temperature we were speaking about? And uh, what it was was only about five degrees. But it was all due to the change in the tropics to pole temperature difference with very little contribution from the tropics itself. Okay, that, that's sort of interesting. On the one hand, it's telling you the change in mean temperature associated with major climate change wasn't that big, five degrees. On the other hand, its source was something that didn't seem like greenhouse. So, do you say that it doesn't seem like greenhouse because the I'll temperatures come back the... to that? Okay. Because you know the tropics haven't changed much. What happened was some people purely arbitrarily argued that when you did the greenhouse warming. Changes that were small, we we're talking about one degree, two degrees, and so on, were not that far from four to five degrees that represented major climate change. And so they began plugging away at what are called positive feedbacks. Now, in nature, you have something called shuttle, the Chatelier's principle. It's just saying that stable systems, if perturbed, try to return to their original state. And that implied negative feedbacks. All of a sudden, uh, Suki Minabe, others, said, if we assume that water vapor's relative humidity remains fixed, then if you go up a certain amount in temperature, you'll increase the amount of water vapor the air holds, and you'll amplify the greenhouse effect from CO2, doubling it. And then people chimed in, maybe you can make the clouds work in such a way that they'll amplify it even more. And you soon get close to the point where you're quickly amplifying it as much as you want. And uh, you're up to the five degrees associated with major climate change. The problem was that was multiple. First, there were the feedbacks. Second of all, there was the notion of what is causing that five degrees in the past. Mm. Okay, that's a lot to take in at once. But what I was curious about is, uh, were there no negative feedbacks in the system? And so I spent a semester at NASA, I had some colleagues there, and we were looking at the data, and it was not trivial to look at it. But one of the things is uh, you have upper level cirrus in the tropics, clouds, thin clouds. And we usually think of clouds as reflecting sunlight. But when they get very thin, they're actually greenhouse substances. They absorb infrared. And so we wondered how they varied as surface temperature varied. What we found, and we found it numerous times again, although it's a hard measurement to take, is that when the temperature at the surface warmed, the clouds decreased in area. And when the surface got colder, they increased in area. And this would be a negative feedback. And indeed, oddly enough, P 
people then looked at how infrared changed. And even some of the proponents, Kevin Trenberth and the Sulo of warming, found indeed the, neg the feedbacks in the infrared were negative. What was the response of some of the modeling community to this? Well, first, they didn't make big noise about it. But second of all, they started desperately looking for feedbacks in the visible to find something that would maintain a large value. The iris effect is what we refer to when in response to surface temperature, the area covered by cirrus got larger and smaller, sort of like your eye when exposed to light the iris changes size. That's where the name comes from. Uh, it got, you know, as soon as it was published, the editors called for rebuttals. There were six or seven. We were not permitted to answer them until six months passed. And uh, some of them were ludicrous. One of them even cited differences in the data from what we found. but didn't notice that the differences in the data would make the iris effect stronger. Uh, so <laughs> that's, that went on. But the, you see, so that was one of the things. How do you crank up the greenhouse to be competitive with past climates? But then we come back to the past climates. They were due almost entirely to changes in the temperature difference between the tropics and the pole with nothing going on in the tropics. If you look at the warming since about 1860 or 1800, it has no contribution from the change in temperature between the tropics and the pole. That's essentially zero. And it's all from the tropics, which is exactly different from what happened in major climate change. Now, what the alarmists argue with no basis at all that I know of, is that what happens in the Arctic is an amplification of what happens in the tropics. There's absolutely no evidence of that in the data. And we'll hopefully be able to publish the data on it because we've analyzed the observations and the models and so on. It's fascinating. I mean, the models are basically tuned to hug the data as long as they can. And as soon as you get to the end of the data, they start flying off the handle. <laughs> and that's been something that, you know, John Christie has pointed out for years. Anytime you look at model predictions of what will happen in the next 10 years and the 10 years pass, they've all run much too hot. And uh, somehow that's ignored. <laughs> When you say that the tropic the the data doesn't show a change in the temperature of the tropics relative to the temperature of the poles, is that just showing that there's just a general increase in uh, temperature? Okay. Now you're hitting on something subtle, and you, you hit on something before with the paleoclimate. Paleoclimate, obviously if you're talking about tenths of a degree, is not going to be at the accuracy of the instrumental record, whatever its problems. And, it, you know, it has some advantages. You know, if you go to the Vostok ice core and you're looking at uh, isotopes of oxygen, you can assume it's probably characteristic of something that's been mixed over decades and hundreds of years because it's very coarse. And that, that has some benefits also. But uh, no, I mean, it's essentially, for instance, the first people to put together a picture of what happened in the last glacial maximum. This is called the Climap Program. And, you know, it was written up in Science Magazine. And what they found was that you had the temperature difference increasing pronouncedly and the tropics actually being a little bit warmer than the present. Okay. Now, that would make sense if you were changing the temperature gradient in the extra tropics, okay, 
and uh, drawing the heat needed to keep the poles warmer than they would be in the absence of heat transport, what they were. So, for instance, if the poles got colder, you'd need less heat out of the tropics, and the tropics would be warmer. If the poles, like in the Eocene, got much warmer than today, 20 degrees warmer, then you'd expect more heat flux out of the tropics, and the tropics would be colder. So the first papers actually showed that. They showed that the tropics were a little bit colder during the Eocene and a little bit warmer during the Ice Age, glacial maximum. Okay. Now, this immediately contradicted the greenhouse picture where whatever happens in the tropics gets amplified. And so there was an immense effort made to modify the data, to quote, correct it. And so today, the literature is saying that uh, the tropics during the last glacial maximum were a bit colder, a bit warm, a bit colder than they are today. You know, I can't argue that with the Eocene, there were desperate efforts to warm it up. I mean, uh, and uh, where they stand at the moment is they are arguing the temperature was the same and uh, not colder. You know, it's again with paleo data, I, you know, I don't know what you do. But uh, what we can see is in the present, since the last 150 years or so, there's no sign of polar amplification. And the physics of what determines it is almost entirely due to extratropical behavior. Now, this is, again, a subtle matter. I mean, you know, I, I can't imagine school children dealing with it. It's in a graduate course at MIT, but... Well, they're still uh, using the Bohr model of the atom, so we're going to have to forgive them for... Whatever. <laughs> I'm not mean, getting into the complexities. I mean, you know, I can't blame them. I, I'm against teaching science in elementary school. For an obvious reason. I mean, science is a mode of inquiry. And what you teach in elementary school is science as facts. This mm. is not the philosophical basis of science. Mm. Uh, science museums also suffer from that often. Uh, but, you know, that's another story. Uh, you know, we, we often don't recognize things. Uh, you know, the tropics are profoundly different from the extra tropics. I'm not sure how many people realize this. What are the prevailing winds in the tropics? Which direction do they go? Don't they kind of like point like this towards the equator? Well, that's a Hadley circulation. But what is the zonal flow? Is it easterly or westerly? Well, in the northern e hemisphere, it's westerly. In the, in the southern hemisphere, I guess it's both, westerly. They're both westerly. And the tropics, it's easterly. I see. Why is that? And that's, it roughly occurs between 30 degrees north, north, you know, poleward, 30 degrees equatorward. And there, there is a reason for it. We, we know the reason. We've known it for a very long time. It's the rotation of the Earth. And it turns out the impact of the rotation on the flow depends on the vertical component of the rotation vector. Remember, the rotation vector is going through the axis of rotation of the Earth, right? And so at the equator, this is parallel to the surface, not perpendicular, right? So you have no what is called Coriolis effect. So, so it weren't rotating. On the other hand, when you get to the higher latitudes, the extratropics, there is a significant vertical component. And that constrains the flow. 
So in the extra tropics, we have something that the meteorologists refer to as quasi-geostrophy. Now, what that means is the flow, if you're measuring it, you know, looking at the constant pressure surfaces, normally if we look at pressure gradients in a pipe or something, we expect the flow to be from high pressure to low pressure. But if you look at a weather map, the flow is predominantly parallel to the isobars. Hmm. And it's constrained from ironing out the temperature gradients. That's why we have temperature gradients in the extratropic, north-south temperature gradients. In the tropics, there is very little constraint from rotation. And so flow is from high pressure to low pressure, and it wipes out the gradients. So if you look at a temperature map of the Earth, the tropics are fairly flat. They're almost homogeneous in temperature. Hmm. You don't get a lot warmer when you reach the equator from 20 degrees. And so this is a very different regime. You mentioned before there's a circulation rises at the equator and goes out or rises in the summer hemisphere and reaches. And that carries momentum. And helps form the subtropical jet that's part of the weather map and sort of separates the extra tropics from the tropics. And, you know, so they're very different regimes. Past climate that was extreme really depended on the extra tropics. And what happened at the equator, if you understand the term, was just an integration constant. So if it warmed a degree at the equator, it added a degree every place. It didn't get amplified as mm. you went to the pole. The gradient was determined by the extratropics and the dynamics of the extratropics, and to a certain extent by ocean circulation, which brings one to another issue, natural variability. Let us say we can pin down how major climate change works. What about the minor stuff we're seeing now? Well, that's always occurring because, you know, our notion of the climate as, quote, stable is based on the fact that the surface of the Earth is in equilibrium with the sun. But the surface of the Earth over most of the Earth is ocean. An ocean has its own circulation systems that are continuously carrying heat away from and toward the surface. The surface is never in equilibrium. The ocean is much denser than the air. As a result, the circulation systems are slower. They range from a few years in the El Nino cycle, Enso cycle, to millennia for the deepest circulations. So you have a system that would be changing uh, even if nothing external was changing. And for some reason, and again, you may understand this better than I do, natural variability is out of people's thinking. If something changes, something external had to change it. They don't ask this question with sunspot cycles. Nothing external is causing them. They just happen. They don't ask this question with magnetic reversals, which just happen. And in fact, one of the things I worked on earlier in my career was the wind in the stratosphere over the equator. It happens to go from east to west for a year and then turn around and go from west to east for another year with an average period of 26 months. And that's more important than the annual or semi-annual cycle by far. And it does it by itself. It's just an built-in oscillation to the system. And so, you know, one of the things that current models are terrible at, natural internal variability, they don't show any of it. And so when they say only increasing uh, CO2 can cause warming, they're not commenting on CO2, they're commenting on a failure of their model. Well, I think that this goes back to what Shiloh was trying to get us to, which is that... Why? <laughs> Well, right, because I mean, you, you get to a point where you're looking at the science and you recognize that there are natural oscillatory cycles. 
process. I think that natural oscillatory cycles are inherently something that is viewed as being, I don't want to say quacky, but when you start talking about harmonics and resonance and these sorts of larger systems, I think a lot of people just immediately dismiss that because what they want to see is they want to see this arc of directional motion that humans have a large part in. And I think that this comes Absolutely. back to what Shiloh was talking about. Yeah, no, I mean, you're... you're... I think Shiloh was also asking, why is this being promoted? Mm -hmm. And that's a slightly separate question. Maybe not so slightly. Yeah. The I mean, to some extent, I think that the nuance is... The nuance is hard for people to parse, and the news and media and public relations want something easy, and they want to be sure. able to communicate clear, clearly and effectively. But, it, but there's other forces here, too. I just think that the puzzle is the really fascinating subject to me personally because I have a hard time putting my finger on it in discussions. Like, I'll encounter conversations constantly. Like I said, we'll have academics on this show. Maybe they're a physicist. Maybe they're a psychologist. But they all seem to be carrying the flag of carbon dioxide as the primary problem facing humanity, this existential threat. And I have a hard time discussing the nuances of this puzzle <laughs> because I, I understand that that's horribly oversimplified. I'm concerned about a lot of things in the environment besides CO2, but I have a really hard time giving a non, you know, I, I don't want to like fall into the conspiracy theory bin and I want to understand the nuances of the forces that are driving this narrative, which is clearly ignoring a lot of really important information that should be part of the puzzle. Yeah, I mean, you're asking me a question that I wonder about as well. Um, as you say, you don't want to wander into conspiracy theories. But, you know, in many ways, you, it's hard to fi figure out what isn't a conspiracy theory. So, you know. I just learned the other day, I guess, like a conspiracy theory nowadays just means anything that's not about the consensus narrative. Yeah. I thought it was actually like you had to actually point at some shadowy deep throat character or something, but I don't think that's what it means anymore. It's just I, not, I, th I think you know. just uh, you know, politicians have their own views. Power is a narcotic. But I think there there are you know, there are things that I wouldn't quite rank as conspiracy theory, but there are things that have worried me for a long time and uh one of them was the post-world war ii period and it was a remarkable period to live through um after the war you had you know millions of soldiers returning home you had the gi bill People who otherwise would not have afforded college were going to college. Working people in steel mills, machinists in Western Mass, and so on, all could afford homes and cars and live well. The house I live in, in Newton, Mass, which is now a prosperous suburb, I bought from a janitor. Wow. Uh, and, and this was, I think, Magnificent. This was the beginning of the Cold War also, the post-war period. And you were, your family was in Russia. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so here in the workers' paradise, uh, people were not doing so well. And here in capitalist America, people had houses and cars and were working and had dignity and so on. Um, normally, I would think people would be happy about that. My wife, for instance, grew up in France, lived in France during the war. Um, she came to America in 1956 or something, seven, to go to college. Her mother had gone to college in Ohio. 
And uh, they were sending kids from Europe, mainly Americans returning from Europe, on uh, former troop boats. And so she was with a lot of young people, and all of them uh, expressing a hatred for America. Hmm. On their way to America, though? Yeah, they were returning to America from Europe. They were Americans. Oh, I see. And, you know, they were full of infatuation of sophisticated Europe and look at how uh, plebeian America is. And I saw this when I was in college. Um, Samuelson's book on economics, I don't know if it's still used, Samuelson and someone else now, <laughs> was saying, you know, communism was obviously superior. And you had Pete Seeger. I don't know if you remember the folk singer, Pete mm -hmm. Seeger. Yeah, for sure. Uh, little houses made of ticky tack, sort of denigrating the aesthetics of these people who now had houses and cars. Um, so that really permeated a lot of thinking that there was something wrong with ordinary working people living the same way as wealthy people used to live. And I can't help feeling that still permeates a lot of thinking. The Vietnam War accentuated that in a great way. Remember, this was a war where they finally, uh, at the end, got rid of the draft, but they had the draft. So what happened? People who didn't go to college went to war. People who could afford to went to college and got draft deferments. So the first time we had divided the society. And what did the people who had deferments say? That they were superior, that this was an evil war. I, you know, you can have your own views on it. I often wondered why were people fleeing from the north to the south rather than vice versa. But didn't matter. All through universities, by this time I was teaching, everyone was against the war. And uh, if you were on a plane, people were on planes and there were veterans on the plane, uh, they wouldn't sit next to them. And remember, the veterans all were essentially working class. So you have this divide in America and it's been growing. And uh, it's, it's, Worrisome. Now we've, you know, the whole thing is continuing. We've gotten rid of manufacturing, and you go to Western Massachusetts, and there are disaster zones mm -hmm. where people used to be machinists or workers in factories. They're now on fentanyl. I mean, you know, so it, I think part of this is part of a gestalt uh, kind of attitude formation and, and of course by now what percentage of the population is going to college it's huge mm -hmm. and in many cases it makes no sense i mean uh my wife likes to pick up used books and she picked up one that was a book called mathematics for tradesmen it was from england it was from the 1930s and uh, I looked at it, and I have the feeling most of our freshmen at MIT couldn't handle it. Mm. And so, you know, this push to put everyone in college means we're withdrawing people we need in machining and carpentry and the trades because those fields need skills. And, you know, so... I think one problem in thinking about your question, you know, is there a deep plot or anything, is to recognize that the problem is multifaceted and it's coming from a variety of directions. You know, the women's movement played a major role, obviously. When I was a kid, women had very few choices. They could be uh, nurses, secretaries, teachers, housewives, maybe a clerk in a supermarket or something. But of these, teaching was probably one of the best choices in some sense. 
And so my teachers, both when, women and men, for different reasons, were outstanding. By 30 years ago, 40 years ago, women had hugely more choices, and teaching was not high among them, for most. And if you go to an ed school, any place, including Harvard, the standards are much lower than in the disciplinary departments. And they're basically indoctrination centers. And so you're turning out teachers who are, may not be very good at math and may not be very good at English. And they're teaching our kids. And the first generation of these kids who are taught by people who are no longer the te taking teaching as an elite occupation are now in their 50s. Mm. And they're CEOs. <laughs> and so, you know, you gradually modify a society in very profound ways. And what, yeah, like what is the result of that? How, how does that feed back into the climate narrative? Well, in the climate narrative, it depends on how you look at it. But look at what you're doing. You're increasing the cost of housing. You're telling people they can't have cars. You're telling them that uh, they have to get rid of their gas stoves. You're telling them that they can't heat their house with fossil fuels. They need heat pumps. Many of these things are both inefficient, ineffective, and too expensive. So you're basically telling ordinary people, come back to where you belong. You don't deserve your house. You don't deserve your car. And, you know, that's underlying a lot of this. And there's no question that the people who are earning a couple of hundred grand or a million dollars a year, they're not going to be affected by this. And, you know, John Kerry is a bit of a cartoon character, but, you know, I'm very important. So, of course, I have to drive, fly private aircraft. Mm. Well, that's always this idea of a restriction that is not for me, but it is for you, is a yeah. pretty common feature of these sorts of puritanical perspectives. And the well, idea that we have the to... Puri the Puritans, to be fair, were puritanical. <laughs> I'm, which, which do, you mean, do, do, you, do you mean to point to their success as, as a consequence of the... No, no, what I'm saying is, you know, in the early Bay State, Cameron, Massachusetts, Mm -hmm. The Puritans often were religiously committed to Puritanism. And sure. they, I think that people are still religiously committed to these sorts of Oh, these are some of them. Yeah. But when you're looking at the hypocrisy, that was not always a part of Puritanism. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that it I think that it arose I mean Malthus is a really easy place to point to, right? The population is growing too fast, where food increases yeah, sure. slower, we're going to be screwed, there's too many people. That proves out to be wrong because we have the industrial, the agricultural revolution. Then the same thing starts to happen in the 1970s again with Paul Ehrlich, who writes The Population Poem. And it's with, the uh, with I should mention, a co-author, mm. John Holdred. Mm who is currently, I believe, America's science advisor. Well, and Paul Ehrlich still has, a, I think he's chair of the Stanford Biology Department. That may be true. He pretty much destroyed their study of butterflies, which was his specialty. But I, the, the Ehrlich thing is crazy because you read the population bomb and he's like, okay, so India has too many people. And what we ought to do if we were really going to be rational about this is we should cut off food aid and forcibly sterilize the people as a consequence. And we began doing that. I know. And so this thing about climate and what you're pointing to about, you know, the rich people aren't going to be the ones that give up their gas stoves because, well, how can you cook on anything except for a gas stove? It's the ultimate cooking experience. They're not going to be the ones that are taking the low if or the high efficiency appliances that don't work as well. They're, They're going to certainly be not going to stop driving their cars. I mean, they'll all get Teslas or whatever, right? It's like they'll pay uh, the super rich. Well, they love their their old 
muscle yeah. cars and vintage yeah. Mustangs and stuff. Yeah. 67 Corvette. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, but I mean, I, this yeah. just seems like a really deep thing that's run across our culture for a long time, which was the belief that there are, in fact, too many people. And if anything, technological progress over the course of the last 20 years, and especially over the course of the last 10 years, has really drawn attention to the fact that, well, why do we need all these people going to school? Why do we need all these people doing email jobs? We need people who are going to be the plumbers and the mechanics, but we don't need that many of them. And so there does seem to be this very, very strong feeling among the wealthy of, you know, the world is overpopulated and we need to get rid of people. And climate folds into that intimately in a really weird and creepy way because there's no way to get fewer people in the world without either literally getting rid of them or messing with their reproductive choices like we did in India where you forcibly sterilize people. We're just or, making it extremely expensive to have children. Mm, right? that's, that's one of the things. The other is, of course, frightening the children so that they feel there's no reason to have a family. Mm. Uh, there's no future for mankind, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, or just making it seem like people are kind of a, a scab on the earth, you know, that humanity, like earth was somehow this magical garden and then people showed up and ruined everything. Uh, and, uh, you know, even it, the way that people talk about the things that we do is unnatural kind of gives me the creeps a little bit because I'm like, hey, we're just animals. You know, you look at ants and they're completely reworking their environment. They're transforming the <laughs> soil and the trees around them. They're farming aphids, like... Unless there are just... carpenter ants who are eating your house. <laughs> well, then it's just war. Then it's just war between me and the ants. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that what's happening here is is absolutely a natural process. That the Earth has formed animals. It's formed humans, and we're we're doing the same thing as everybody else. Yeah, but it's rare that there's that the, that there's a scientific field that comes to be. M- manifestly used for a political purpose the way the climate has been. You know, this has begun a little earlier. I mean, the politicization of science is not totally new. Uh, and, you know, part of it, I think, stems from the success of science. Mm. Uh, politicians envy that. And uh, the public often responds to it, I think, improperly by attaching authority to science. Mm -hmm. And authority is something the political system envies greatly. So they're always wanting to co-opt science. Um, I wrote a piece quite a few years ago comparing the eugenics movement with the current climate issue. Mm. And again, it was everyone agreed, the American Philosophical Society, the major bio labs, the institutions, that eugenics was necessary. Mm. And much evil was done in its name. Ultimately, one of the evils done in its name was the racism of Nazi Germany, and that discredited eugenics. But in its heyday, you had everyone from Alexander Graham Bell to Thomas Edison to George Bernard Shaw, uh, you know, on and on and on, Norman Vincent Peale, all saying this was necessary. And we were sterilizing, you know, thousands and thousands of people because they were, you know, deficient in brain power. Well, there's that that eugenics movement is alive and well today. Like there are people who are there was there's this website, a uh, YouTube channel called Free Think, where they promote big ideas and have advocates for you know whatever's popular in the moment. And there was one recently, which is you know, eugenics is actually good. You know, it's interesting because one of the comparisons with climate. Of course, COVID has also introduced some comparisons, mm. but uh, is the fact that eugenics is almost unique in that there exists a mathematical theorem 
the Hardy-Weinberg theorem mm. that shows that eugenics policies cannot produce a meaningful change in population over any reasonable period of time. Can you elaborate on that? Because I'm familiar with the Harvey Weinberg equilibrium. No, knowledge. Hardy. No, Hardy. 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 <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that's the guy at the movie studio, Harvey Weinberg. <laughs> no. Yeah, right. Weinstein. No. Weinstein. Yeah. <laughs> I'm mixing things up, but I'm familiar no, no, with I, it from biology. No, but elaborate yeah. on that. I can't really elaborate very much on it. It's not my field, but I mean, you know, it, it, it's a relatively simple theorem. There are a number of places where they have the proof reproduced. I think uh, recently there's a book by uh, uh, David uh, Berlinski on uh, science after Babel, which <laughs> goes through this a bit. Uh, no, I mean, you know, it, it's it's not a difficult theorem. It just says that if you have the distributions of population that you have and you try to use control over mating, uh, you're going to have severe limitations on how much change you can affect in any given time. Mm. Uh, I mean, as you know, Hardy was purely a mathematician, one of the great pure mathematicians. And Weinberg, I think, had a biology background. And so you're just suggesting that any eugenics campaign would feel uh, fundamentally just because yes, it's yeah. too complex? Well, yeah, there's too much variations, too many genetic components that are at issue. Mm. And uh, our the understanding whole, of genetics isn't really good enough to be able to do this. That's, uh, even if way. it were, it wouldn't work very well. I'm surprised. It, sound, what, cause it sounds tempting. Embryo selection, because a lot of the people, uh, a lot of the the big eugenics push right now is embryo selection. Ah, uh, uh, you know, okay. If you did that, I think you would violate the conditions for the Hardy Weinberg, because you're you're basically no longer allowing any chance. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Because the idea is this of. You know, we have these tools available that allow us to evaluate what genes are present in the embryos. We yeah. can tie these genes to various things like resistance I to mean, depression, intelligence, et cetera. You know, I Height. would I would advise these people to go to any math department and suddenly realize that great mathematicians often are very close to being autistic. <laughs> <laughs> That's I know. That's my biggest problem with this because a lot of the times what the eugenics movement wants to optimize for is intelligence. Well, a particular kind of intelligence, that autistic kind of intelligence, right? <laughs> it's, it's not it's not a procedural <laughs> it's not like how to have a really fulfilling life with lots of social relationships and healthy activities and ra you know, raise an incredible family. It's like how to crunch numbers and rotate shapes and manipulate words which is a very particular kind of intelligence. Yeah. Yeah, even, you know, within science, I know when I was teaching, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, I it took a while to realize that uh, there wasn't an exact correspondence between brightness and research capability. Mm. I mean, there obviously were limits. I mean, uh, you know, uh, a person who, you know, had a very low IQ is not going to be a great research scientist. But it was equally true that many people who were very brilliant uh, did not have whatever the instinct was needed for research. Well, research uh, well, is a very dull, I, like, I am one of the people that, like, I went through a PhD program, bless my advisor for getting me through that. But research requires a certain mindset of just reproducibility and constancy that I think that some people just aren't cut out for. And like, yeah, Ad, I was going to say Adam Mastroianni, who we just had on the show, he's a scholar at Columbia, and he, yeah. he, he, he breaks this down into two different types of intelligences. One where you're addressing established problems, 
And that's something that autists and AI and things like this are really good at. If there's a well-inscribed problem, they can kind of crank away at it. But the ability to see new problems that weren't there before is something that you don't really see much promise in AI for. And it's something that's difficult to measure in these standardized tests and in these, you know, you want someone in the lab who's very good at crunching away at your established process if you're a PI who's got a grant to work on X, Y, or Z problems. But in terms of making new discoveries, you, that's a totally different kind of intelligence where you're able to step back and see something in a completely new way. There's almost an artistic level to that. Oh, yeah. I mean, but different fields are different also. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, for instance, uh, I always, you know, gave students different problems. I was not interested in a group working and I tended to like problems that had a puzzle to them mm. in a way. It could be naive or something, but uh, there had to be a, a question that could be answered. Um, there are, uh, if I look at molecular biology, obviously it's very different from uh, fluid mechanics or things like that. Uh, you have these large labs, you have lots of people doing relatively dull work in some ways, but they're part of a team, and you have dozens of teams doing the same work all over, racing to see who will get it first. That's a totally different ma mentality than mathematics or theoretical <laughs> physics. Hmm. Just in the sense that uh, those are more collaborative in terms of trying to shoot for it's the same It's collaborative. Problem. It has a kind of fixed routine. Uh, it requires skills. But uh, there seems to be a general agreement on where everyone should be going. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's an emphasis on speed. Well, there's. I think that with a lot of the the biology stuff is that if you get a patent, then you can start a business and you can make a lot of money. I think there are again a number of things. First of all, energy, the energy sector, has always been vulnerable to that. It's just so big, so essential, so central. So, for instance. Uh, when the mullahs took over Iran and there was an oil crunch, MIT was just full of people figuring out how to get energy from garbage, energy from this, energy from that, this, that, and the other thing. Uh, and yeah, it was a temptation. It's a temptation anytime there's something big. In biology, you have the pharmaceutical industry. And so as we've seen with COVID, it's billions and billions of dollars. It's actually not on a scale with energy. Energy is bigger. And so you can imagine the motivations can be greater on that. Uh, somebody once, I think it was Hayek, who had an aversion to engineers. And the question was, why? <laughs> And I think his answer was basically that uh, they love to solve problems even if they don't exist. Mm. Uh, but, I mean, uh, be that as it may, you, you see that all the time at MIT. I mean, um, I may have my views about climate change, and I think some of my colleagues actually share them. But as far as the engineers go, it's just an opportunity to build something new and uh, cash in on it. Uh, and, of course, you have the additional problem. And, as you say, money is important. And it may even be the root of all evil, for all I know. But, I mean, whether it is or not, uh, universities now are characterized by their administration. At places like Stanford and MIT, I think. Uh, the number of administrators exceeds the number of students. Mm -hmm. And administrators depend on overhead. And so uh, anything that brings in grants is what they want. 
And if the government says, I'm only bringing in grants for this, that's where the administration is. And again, administrations like the executives of professional societies and so on, uh, often without, uh, you know, polling their constituents, speak for large numbers. And so a president of the university uh, often chooses to speak for the whole university. He doesn't ask people, do they agree? And uh, you have that in many examples. I mean, it happens in every organization I've seen. Uh, organizations are full of people who are enthusiastic about something, but are busy. And once they form an organization, they then have to hire someone who will be an executive secretary or whatever office you call it. And they're happy to offload the day-to-day -day work of an organization on these people. And the price they pay is that person speaks for them. And uh, that's true of universities, of professional societies, companies, the National Academy. <laughs> um, they all have that property. And is there, uh, do you see the do you sense a way back from that? Um, not really. Um, I think you would have to constrain. I mean, I can see a way back, but you'd have to tell people, I'm paying you a fortune, you're going to run this place, but I don't allow you to speak for us without uh, holding us. I suppose that could be done, but it's I've never seen it done. But with climate, with climate, that seems like it wouldn't work because the consensus is so strong. Everybody that you speak to believes fundamentally in CO2 as being the driver of climate change. And our holy responsibility is to decrease CO2 at any means necessary. Think about so even how... If, even, if the, even if the dean polled the university, would that fix it? Well, it depends. It depends. At what stage? And this is, of course, one of the problems. If you had done this polling, for instance, well, let me backtrack a little. In 1988, when James Hansen uh, spoke to the U.S. Senate in a very rigged session, uh, pointing out that we're heading for a dangerous warming, Newsweek had a cover. Newsweek still existed then. I don't think it still exists. In and name only, it's, it's a shock. Okay. Uh, you know, it had a picture of an earth on fire. And the little script underneath, all scientists agree. Hmm. This was before almost anyone I know of even cared about this problem. And indeed, when uh, people were polled by a man called Mark Mills, Gallup ran a poll for him of people working in this area in geophysics and in meteorology. The vast majority felt that there was no evidence of danger. Okay, so how does something like that switch? Because that's a crazy reversal in you said this. Well, was in first the 80s. of all, okay, let's look at that. Yeah, this was the late 80s, early 90s. So, you know, you still had that. For a long time, well into the 90s, um, if I were taking a train to New York, there might be a weather forecaster for one of the media on it, and they'd come and thank me. Weather forecasters as a group were appalled by this. What did the American Meteorological Society do? Well, they licensed these people. And so they said, if they take this view, they need to be re-educated. Sounds familiar? Mm. <laughs> I mean, um, and then you had another thing happen. Uh, under Clinton-Gore, I mean, I remember Gore had already written, I think, one book on this, Earth and the Balance. Mm. And um, funding for climate increased 
by a factor of 15. That was such a huge increase in funding that it was clear it was not meant to support the existing efforts, which are very small. As I say, no one at MIT called themselves a climate scientist. The only lab I know that was large dealing with climate was in then Leningrad, hmm. the main geophysical observatory. And interestingly enough, uh, virtually everyone there, Budiko, Israel, Kondratiev at Leningrad University, all opposed this strongly. Uh, I have a list. I mean, you know, the head of the Weather Bureau, Noah, opposed it, Bob White. Uh, the head of the British Met Office, Mason, opposed this. They all thought it was nuts. Uh, but what you did with increasing the funding, a factor of 15 or so, was to create a whole new community that knew their very existence was because of this issue. And then, you, you know, just as at the beginning, Newsweek said all scientists agree when no scientists were into this practically, uh, eventually that had its own dynamic. You keep repeating, as Goebbels noted, that all scientists agree, and pretty soon you believe all scientists agree. How does the government come to increase funding for a discipline that doesn't exist by an order of magnitude? Very easy. Yeah, like, what were the forces that were driving oh, to write that it, book? Like, what, what, what was going on under the surface? Oh, I mean, it has an obvious attraction for politicians, just as global cooling did and the ozone hole did. All of these were runners up to that, you know, scare the public. <laughs> the ozone hole was particularly interesting in that respect. I mean, it was restricted to Antarctica. And yet it was frightening. And what was involved then? I mean, it was relatively little. Freon, DuPont had, his patent had run out on Freon. So they had a real interest in banning Freon. It was being made cheaply in India. And, you know, so the scare was uh, you deplete ozone and you'll increase skin cancer. And so the question was, uh, how much were you really decreasing extreme ultraviolet? Turns out, outside of Antarctica for one and a half months a year, the decrease in exposure to UV was essentially the decrease you would encounter in going from Boston to New York. And I didn't know anyone who worried about that. But well, it, it got rid of... It's really interesting because I, I, I had this, this thing in my mind that the ozone hole actually was still there and I verified yeah. it. And the ozone sure. hole is still there. We just don't oh, yeah. talk about it anymore. Yeah. Of course. Like we just, at some point, because I think that there was, it was declared as a huge victory because it did decrease for a couple of years. But it uh, seems like there's some kind of natural cycle where it just oh, grows. Oh, uh, there shrinks. was a guy at the University of Washington, K.K. Tung, who had been pointing out that the natural circulation would lead to a annual, you know, one and a half month, a depletion of ozone. Uh, constrained by a vortex under the, around the South Pole. It was a, very much a dynamic phenomenon, very much restricted to the South Pole. Wasn't going to grow and wasn't going to spread. Uh, and uh, he was beaten down. Hmm. I mean, this is so, it's, it's so frightening and frustrating to consider that it is a new mode of psychological warfare to harvest people's compassion and concern for each other, right? Because the oh, yeah. hole in the ozone is concern for other people's safety and well-being. It's concern for the the penguins' well-being. Everything that happened during COVID was concern over your neighbor's well-being. And there's this constant drumbeat of do the right thing to protect the person next to you 
But if yeah, the right thing is being motivated by DuPont's patent for Freon running out, then and Pfizer's thirty billion dollars of profit over the course of a single year, then what are you really being enlisted into? Well, you've answered your own question. You've been paid off in virtue for uh, helping someone's uh, finances. That really, and that really freaks me out because yeah. <laughs> people really want to do the right thing. And the... Well, the one thing they don't want to do and maybe can't do is dig in in detail. Right. They want to feel virtuous and they're particularly grateful if they can feel virtuous without doing much work. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it would only take, in many cases, checking a few things. Um, you know, when you look at the graph of temperature, look at the axes. Ask for the data. But, you know, people don't do that. Well, but it's they do do that, but they're told that if the temperature goes up by 0.5 degrees, that the world is going to boil. And so they trust that they're not being misled about that. I think the manipulation of axes thing isn't apparent to most people on the street. I mean, I, I didn't realize it until college, honestly. I had mm -hmm. a professor who kind of started to draw my attention to this, and then I started noticing it everywhere. When I would, you know, every time I read a paper now, I, I notice these things. And it's really rampant. I mean, it's absolutely acceptable to have multiple scales on axes, and they're, they're oh, very yeah. difficult to parse. Well, you know, one of the curiosities that I found, and Maybe that's more optimism, basis for optimism. Uh, we mentioned at the beginning the hobby of ham radio. Mm. And one of the things about ham radio that I like uh, is that uh, it seems to draw people from all segments of society. Uh, there are plumbers, there are jewelers. There are doctors, there are lawyers, there are electronic technicians, there are grocery store clerks. And so it, if you're an academic like I am, you really don't meet a lot of different kinds of people as a rule. And ham radio gives you a chance to speak to ordinary people, farmers, so on, which is interesting. And I find, by and large, many of these people who are practical in orientation don't buy into this. They have a reserve of skepticism. Part of the reason is, I think, they're divorced from academia. Uh, if you're not divorced from academia, then you, you're worried about your grade, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, and these people were not. Uh, and that's that, something I feel like you have to fight for, really, especially if you you are involved heavily in these subject matters. This is something that I personally, both of us have had to fight against really hard. And it's been really fascinating because we do this musical project also. And oh, so what we is have... The uh, we just, we have a band and we play, okay. like we just played a show in San Francisco the other, last on, on a Friday night. And it's really fascinating the kind of conversations that you have with that audience versus the kind of conversations we'll have with this audience. It's a very different landscape, and I feel like it's really healthy for me. Because otherwise, yeah. I just find myself being forced into one way of looking at the world, which is just a very different color and tone than people on the street who aren't ha having this, this particular yeah. academic level of scrutiny and you know, also indoctrination. It's uh, And it's hard for academics to find time for stuff like that. I, I had barely any time when I was in grad school to get out and interact with normal people. So uh, No, no, the, it's amazing how much more open-minded they are. And they just, they just don't have that, that knee-jerk trust in the well, it's dogma. More th it's more than that. I mean, my parents were refugees from Germany. Mm. I came to America in 38. Wow. And um, 
what I noticed, I mean, in Germany in 1933, when Hitler came to power, all the universities in Germany got rid of everyone who was of Jewish origin. I use that word advisedly because that included Fritz Haber. And you may know the name. I mean, Fritz Haber was a Nobel laureate, ultra patriotic German, convert to Lutheranism. And this is the fertilizer guy for people yep, who are listening. Exactly. And the inventor as well of poison gas used during World War I. Mm -hmm. Gone. Now, my father was a boot, boot maker. And he was an observant Jew. And when he died, I looked at his papers. And one of them was his admission to the Guild of Bootmakers in Dortmund, 1935, after Hitler. So even in extraordinary situations like that, academics somehow are more vulnerable. And mm -hmm. I, I think in part, because in a funny way, especially outside of technology, perhaps, and some of science, they don't make anything. They're very, ultimately, for all the prestige they may have, they're very dependent. And for some reason, I think a bootmaker feels he has more independence. He has a discernible skill. He knows why people need him. Hmm. Well, in an academic climate, you're dependent upon the political environment favoring you. We talk about this all the time, where if you have an idea that you want to get accepted, it's as much a theoretical enterprise as it is a political enterprise. You have to make sure that the right people are your friends, that they're willing to say good things about you in rooms when you're not there. There's, there's an enormous you, amount of work. You, you, you're saying something interesting, Nasya. Uh, when, I, uh, when I began teaching, I noticed a certain difference between my women's students and men's students. And it was a little bit puzzling. And, you know, obviously I didn't have a large enough sample to generalize. But it seemed to me when the women were asking questions, I, I don't mean in class, but I mean, you know, the, doing a thesis or something, it would always be a career-oriented question. Hmm. What's the best journal to publish in? What's the best meeting to go to? And so on. Perfectly legitimate questions. But the men, for the most part, were far more naive. They were asking, how does this work? How do you do this? How do you solve this equation? And so on. A very different sort of question. Uh, by the end of my career, there was no difference between the men and women. They were all women. Uh, and so that had permeated everything. Uh, I don't know how much to read into that. I mean, whether it, it was just the sampling, whether it's the particular university or not. But uh, careerism now is far more important than it was then. Well, it, oh, this is so difficult to tease apart because on one hand, you have entry of women into the workforce in a situation where there is not an elastic supply of professor positions. Oh, creates, for sure. Right? So you, you all of a sudden, like, you create a condition where there's twice as many people who are vying for the same number or fewer spots. And so everyone has to become much more political, much more cagey, much more careful about what it is that they're going to do in their career. There's because... one field that solved that problem, I think. Which one? Astronomy. Interesting. Yeah. Well, go ahead. I want to hear what you have to say. But I was going to say that's why I love teaching astronomy because it stays out of a lot of this mess. Well, one of the reasons I mentioned astronomy is I began noticing that um, a lot of the grad students in astronomy, and some of them were friends, uh, loved astronomy. 
and they knew that there were no jobs. And so they looked at graduate school as an opportunity in their lives to do astronomy. And they didn't expect to get a position after it. They went to work as programmers, as physicists, as other things, and just enjoyed the fact that they had three to six years or more uh, where they were astronomers. Uh, there was a certain charm to that. <laughs> and uh, maybe one could extend that. It, I think the problem is astronomy is fun. <laughs> and uh, it has a hobbyist enthusiasm. A lot of things studied at the university are just no fun at all. And uh, that, unfortunately, I mean, is the case very often with things like law, medicine, the traditional professions. That uh, there, it's just, you have to do what you have to do. Mm. Yeah, it's a real pleasure, especially the first year astronomy course, where you have people taking this general science requirement, essentially. Yeah. And, and they're just really curious, and nobody's planning a career in astronomy. They're all just genuinely fascinated by the subjects. And of course, science knows so little, ultimately, about things that are really, really far away. I mean, we can't touch them. We just have light. And so there's this sense of wonder and mystery. There's so many open questions. It just seems like this beautiful, fertile valley of possibilities and yeah, it makes it a really fun class to teach, too. And it's not political, right? Like, what happens, you know, at well, the center it, of the it, galaxy it, is It not... was political at the time of Galileo and Copernicus. Uh, and it's yeah. gotten beyond that. For the moment, yeah. I mean, actually, the climate stuff does creep into our textbook, though, I might add. Oh, which is kind of interesting. Oh, my w wife is collecting children's textbooks, you know, books on explaining weather and climate. And you can't find one these days that isn't propagandizing the kids. Yeah, but it's really interesting. They do it with Venus and Mars. They're like, they're basically like, Venus is what we'll turn into if we keep using yeah. fossil fuels. And, and uh, yeah, they, they always compare these planets in terms of our fate and various outcomes, you know? Yeah. Uh, actually, as I point out in a paper, greenhouse mechanism is useful for comparing planets hmm. because they're so much different from each other that uh, the differences that we on earth call climate extremes are small perturbations. Mm. And there's so much atmospheric pressure too on Venus. I wonder how that plays into things as well. Well, it plays into the sulfuric acid cloud. I mean, that is the ultimate blanket. And then its rotation rate mm. changes yeah, you, the you dynamics. You did some work on Venus, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, we did some work on super rotation on Venus, how you could produce that. Which was essentially circulation of that. Uh, yeah, it essentially, it was saying that uh, you can accelerate a layer of Venus with waves from the surface. And uh, it can super rotate. That doesn't violate conservation of angular momentum. It's super, sorry, it's a stupid question. Is super rotation that the atmosphere rotates faster than the planet does? Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, Venus is such an oddball. You know, it's going the wrong way and it's kind of yeah. pseudo tidally locked to the sun. It's very strange. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know. Simple mechanics still leaves a lot of options. And I think that that's actually one of the most exciting things about the sciences in general right now, which is that for a long time, I think people walked around with this belief that perhaps we were nearing the end of being able to explain everything, where we had this model of the solar system and there was a fixed mode of development. We had the model of the planet. There was a fixed mode of development. It was on an arc. We kind of understood everything. And I feel like in the last few years doing this podcast, I've been exposed to a lot of people who are working on theories of nature that would upend the way that we see the universe. The fundamentals in mm. particular, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I, I avoided going into physics in undergraduate because I, I was 
essentially told by my teachers that everything was zipped up for the most part. There was nothing really left to do. And that really couldn't be further from the truth. And it took me all the way through grad school to get back into it, to realize that there was all of that's, these things that's at the interesting. Edge. I mean, you have physics pretty much stuck with the standard model since late 60s. A lot of people have been pondering the fact that uh, a lot of things haven't advanced since the late 60s. Mm. Technology has, certainly. But that that's, you know, we had the transistor by then. We had photolithography by then. So, you know, there was something to work with. Um, it's hard these to tell. Ideas, these ideas have been solidifying for decades now, and I think that the oh, 60s yeah. were the place where they started to solidify. Yeah. And so we're operating under this solidified paradigm right now where everyone's looking around and they recognize, like you said, the administrative burden at universities is so high that being able to get professors in there that are able to do something that is contrary to what has happened before is almost impossible because the administrators don't understand the science. They trust the science. Oh, and very so often the administrators, like at MIT, often come from the faculty. Doesn't seem to help. Interesting. I didn't realize that. But all of them, like the, all, not of them, all of them. Oh no, no, no! At, like Harvard also is one of those schools where there's seven thousand administrators, and I think yeah. there's about seven thousand students. Yeah, and yeah, most of them are not academic, but you know, at least as window dressing, the president of the university, the provost, and so on. But those are, are fundraising often. positions. Those yeah. are positions oh, yeah. where you're glad handing and you're making sure that the endowment <sighs> stays. Well, yeah, what they mean by trust the science is trust that this is where the funding comes from. Well, I'm just even thinking about, okay, so like at the university level, you have an economic system that's set up, as far as I understand it, as follows. The students that are in the undergrad departments pay tuition, but the tuition is not the largest source of funding for a large university, it's grants, because in most places, the administration gets 50% of a grant that's dispersed to the university. Yeah. So there is a constant push for recruiting grant, for recruiting scientists that will be able to get grants. And the administration knows that it needs to get the scientists that are able to get the grants. And so the person who's sitting at the top of the administration, even if they're former faculty, it doesn't really matter because their goal now is to go out into the world and make sure that the economic stability of the university is maintained. Yeah, I remember, uh, you know, I started college at Rensselaer Poly and uh, I couldn't stand Troy, New York. <laughs> and at the end of the sophomore year, I transferred to Harvard. And uh, you know, that was all well and good. I appreciated the fact that Rensselaer actually never bothered me thereafter. They never asked for funds. They never asked for donations. And I accidentally mentioned this to someone who was from Rensselaer. And then they began calling me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so at one point, uh, they called and said, you know, would you like to contribute? And I said, well, you know, I just heard that your president is earning, you know, one and a half million dollars a year. Yeah, you don't need my money. And he said, what do you mean? Do you know how much money she raises? I said, ah, she's paid on commission. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I mean, it's, yeah, you're probably right. I mean, fundraising is an issue, although it's probably easier for academics, alumni, are incredibly generous and uh, grateful for the college education. I, I'm I'm always impressed by that. I I don't quite know what to make of it. Hmm. Well, I mean, I think that people enjoy the formative experience of a four year school. Like that's something that I think about people losing as the university system gradually implodes. Like, I don't know if you heard about the University of West Virginia. Yeah, they yeah. Financial problems. They hired some consulting company and the consulting company was like, well. Get rid of this department. The, yeah, just get rid of Well, it's the humanities departments, right? It's yeah. the English, it's the literatures, it's the look, Spanish look, language. Brandeis has just gotten rid of its music department. And that's a travesty. Like this yeah. is this. And so yeah. alumni, I think, donate because they want to pro 
propagate the experience that they had, which was a formative experience. But the problem is that the economics of it just aren't working out because how can you have that number of students coming to the university to basically live as... It's kind of a bourgeois experience to go to a fancy four-year college at this point. You have music festivals and they like bring you puppies to pet during finals week. And there's all these (laughs) things that they provide for you. And it's music festivals. Did I already say that? Yeah. I mean, it is wonderful though that those experiences uh, do kind of shape you in a way. They do shape you, but I went to a huge state school. So I went to UCSD. My entry level lectures were four to 500 people. Shiloh went to Kenyon. Shiloh's experience at Kenyon was he had dinner at professors' houses. And like, those are orthogonally related to one another. And everybody lives basically in barracks together all four years. And, you know, most of your incredible experiences are just being exposed to people from all over the country that you'd never met before. It's probably a lot like going to the military or something. You just are hearing new kinds of music, new ideas, new books that you'd never would have come across. There's something very uh, non-academic that's really transformative about that experience. And to wrap this to something that's relevant to what we're talking about here is that I feel like there is a gradual push towards, look, we have everything figured out. We don't need to generate so many people with undergraduate degrees. They can go get a certificate somewhere and then they can go enter a coding farm at, you know, one of the fang companies and do just fine. We can give people uh, professional educations for doing the technical stuff. And that kind of formative, free inquiry university experience seems really like it's on the ropes right now. And that might be why we don't have new ideas. Well, you are pointing to something I haven't thought much about, but certainly the experience of the university combined with the time of life. I mean, you know, to be perfectly fair, uh, you know, between, you know, your late teens and your early 30s, maybe 40, is kind of the peak of your life in a way. Not necessarily, but it's it's a good period for most people. Maybe it's changed with time. But I noticed, I mean, speaking to contemporaries of my parents who lived in Germany in the 30s, this was their t- that time of their life. And despite the horrors of what was going on, the memory was of the good things. Mm. Just mm. let go with that time of life. And so that's part of it. On the other hand, I have someone I know. He's a contractor, and his son finished high school, and he got him into the union's plumbing program. And so at the end of three years, he will have a master plumber's certificate, and his income will be about 110, 120 grand a year. Mm-hmm. Uh, compare that with most people who spent that time in college. Uh, It'll be different on two counts. On the one hand, he'll be better off. On the other hand, he probably will not have the socially pleasurable time that the kids who went to college had, I assume. Um, not that he'll be working all the time, but he'll have to have grown up faster. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it makes me think of the CCC or if there's some alternative to that formative oh. period. Uh, uh, Israel, we... Israel has it. Yeah, exactly. Turkey too. Yeah. As soon as they graduate from high school, they're in the army. And um, that way they uh, pretty much integrate their population. Uh, it was more important in the past. But also, uh, what, what surprised me is they, have a, they look out for the very bright kids, the very talented kids, the kids who are exceptional double bass players. And uh, they use the army period to both 
monitor and cultivate that. So, yeah, it's not, it's, it doesn't, I think people don't understand that it's not just this military experience. Like my advisor in grad school went through it in Turkey and he was like, look, it's basically a period where you're getting, your skills are getting cultivated. He was like, I had to by law shoot a gun once, but they gave me, they only had like two bullets or something. And they were like, okay, now you're in the, now you're officially a soldier. But in reality, he was working in some high end, high tech end of the communications department, working on the kind of electronic circuits that he would later develop and put to use in atomic force microscopy. And, and so yeah, I, I mean, it doesn't have to be this absolutely. You know, killing field thing. Well, it's not just that. I mean, you know, uh, early on in Israel, of course, they drafted women. And there was the fear that they were discovering in 48 that women could be more violent than men. Hmm. And um, they felt this was a problem. But they discovered something women were very good at, which was training. Hmm. And so, uh, at least last I knew, maybe it's changed, most of the tank command tra people training tank commanders were women. Um, no, I mean, you know, the, the point of that, whether it's Turkey or Israel, or should have been in the U.S., uh, the military service service a very important social role. I think the U.S. made a big mistake in getting rid of uh, universal service. Yeah, but what, what about something more civil like the CCC? I thought that was a, that's a really intriguing program because it, it takes all of these aspects of mandatory service and diverts them towards civil purposes, oh. reconstruction of the infrastructure and you know, yeah. devotion to the national parks and like all I, these I, really beautiful I suspect, things. I suspect that only would have worked with the depression. Hmm, why do you say so? It's pretty depressed in some, you know, by some metrics right now, despite oh, the GDP stuff. Yeah, yeah. I think at the moment, while what you're saying is true, uh, there's too much variability. It mm. would impact different segments differently. Uh, you want something, I think, that is truly universal. Mm. And CCC, you know, Civilian Conservation Corps, had a certain charm, but I don't think it would have worked without the Depression. Just because there was no alternative for yeah, what those kids could be doing? Yeah, it was preferable to a lot of the other options at mm. the time. Um, you know, it's like you had the Peace Corps, and uh, that was, in a way, a nice thing and a good idea, and a lot of people did good things and benefited from it and so on. Uh, but I don't think, first of all, we didn't have the wherewithal to institute that universally. I mean, one of the things that we do now is we're avoiding universal military service because, in a sense, we can't afford it. Mm. Mm. And so it involves a significant commitment. How is that possible? Our defense budget is astronomical. Who does it go to? I mean, Raytheon and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, you know, it, it's a very large budget. Uh, whether it's even enough is a question. Hmm. In in what terms? You know, maintenance, you know, for instance, uh, you know, we have the war in Ukraine and there's a legitimate concern. What if it escalates? Are we prepared? Um, there, there's good reason to suppose we have not done good maintenance on our nuclear stockpile. Hmm. Uh, our fleet has not been adjusted. Uh, there are a lot of things going on, and there's certainly a, a very important defense industry, and there are certainly big lobbyists, but whether there's thoughtful uh, maintenance of our military status is not so clear. Um, 
I think there's depends. a general feeling like it's it's not necessary. You know, it's that yeah. there hasn't been a lot of war in the last I don't know fifty years on the scale of previous you know centuries, and so right. why should we put be putting all this money into it? There's nobody to fight. We're cooperating well, with China, Russia's Europe know, marginalized. Has done that. Yeah, Europe uh, will not put two three percent of the GDP into defense. Um, and it's hard. I mean, America never did. I mean, you know, characteristic of the U.S. is after a major war, World War I, World War II, we really disarm. Mm -hmm. uh, the funniest was Japan. I, I think after World War II, you know, we had uh, preparations for a land war in Japan. Lots of jeeps, tanks, and so on. And uh, I don't think we spent the money to bring them back home. Uh, there was a guy, I'm trying to remember his name. He was a refugee in Japan from Europe. And he bought them. Hmm. And when the Korean War started, he sold them back. Mm -hmm. That's a long time to hold that. Well, most of it in your house. Yeah. But I mean, I it wasn't that long. It was three years for crying. Out. It was only three years. I didn't realize yeah. that. Yeah, forty-five. You, still, you can still buy like these uh, military surplus. There's like a website where you can go and try and buy old used-up Hummers and stuff. Really cheap, actually. I was just thinking about how your granddad. So uh, Shiloh's granddad was in World War II, and he came back and on a GI salary bought an airplane. And him and yeah. his with, his, with a body. Oh, airplanes were very common among people I knew until the last 30 years when they suddenly became unaffordable. But buying a Piper Cub or a Cessna was not out of the question. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's... It's just hard to imagine. You see these Iraq war vets and they come back and buy, like, some sort of uh, crotch rocket motorcycle or something on a lease. And it's just hard to imagine being a soldier coming back and buying an airplane. It's just... It, it really just boggles my mind. I mean, it was always funny. You know, in the 50s, I was a kid and I was playing with radio. Ham radio at that time. And there was uh, the electronics section in downtown Manhattan. And you could go down to Radio Row. And they had, were ser selling a lot of war surplus equipment. And if you were interested in microwaves, they had uh, a portable radar. Wow. Portable meant it had a handle. It weighed about a ton. <laughs> <laughs> Wheels not included. No. <laughs> so, no, I mean, you know, as I say, we disarmed. And we always did. And uh, the post-World War II period, when it turned into the Cold War, did not permit that. It was, uh, people were always on edge. And, uh, but that was unique to the U.S. Uh, we didn't normally stay armed. And uh, with the wars of the post-war period, Korea, Vietnam, and so on, uh, these were all ambiguous wars. Mm. They never ended in victory. They never ended in loss. They never ended in anything. You just left. Yeah, terrorism is a great example of that too, right? It's just, just like who are we? Who are we fighting exactly? Like, you're telling me these people in Afghanistan are threatening my freedom here in America somehow, but we have to send all of these tanks and helicopters and deal with it somehow. But it's it's very, very unclear. Well, yeah, I mean, if there was even an, an impact of this. Well, you know, nine eleven suggested that terrorists could be painful. Mm. Nothing new to that, and it was used probably as an excuse to do something that people wanted to, in Washington wanted to do anyway. For sure, and. Um, I mean, you know, the whole thing was a mess. I mean, 
you wanted to get rid of the Taliban, so you went into Iraq where the Taliban wasn't there. Uh, you know, uh, when Iran and Iraq uh, were going to war with each other, why did we end up helping Iraq? Uh, you know, it, it's weird. There's it, no reconciliation about these things to me. That's what's no, that's the no. creepiest part of it all. It's like. It just sort of like weapons of mass destruction, right? Well, there weren't any, and we still invaded that country, and now it's like a, a smoldering crater, essentially, with you know a bunch of criminals running around in gangs, and it's like, what are we going to talk about this at least? Are we going to make sure we don't do this again? Like, well, it strikes no. me that the climate thing is right. just another mobilization towards an end. You have a goal that is in line with what someone in some decisive capacity is interested in. And you manipulate public opinion in direction towards meeting that goal. And as soon as you have enough public support behind it, you can go forth and you can create a mobilization campaign that's on the level of a war campaign because... I think that it's necessary since people don't like war as much as they used to. World War II was the last clear cut, let's go get the Nazis. But ever since then, every single war has just been this endless morass that it's harder and harder to get people to support or to enlist. And so what do you have to do if you're still interested in maintaining that military industrial complex? Well, you have to find some other way to get people to mobilize for a different cause and it's commercial it's capitalist now as opposed to militaristic but it's still mobilization well yes i mean there's no question that that is playing a role um the one thing i do question is whether there is anything but the pleasure of control that's motivating people because you're thinking there's a rational basis, you know, that there's an aim, that there is uh, some such goal in mind. I wonder if for the political class, control is not a narcotic. Mm. I have control mixed with money? Well, money is part of power control. Mm. No. Well, I think about this all the time, right? So there's a lot of studies that people are like, man, we're lonelier than we've ever been before. But then if you start to deconstruct the data, it turns out that as you get richer, you prefer to spend more time alone. And if you are <laughs> rich and you like to spend a lot of time alone, the worst thing possible is that the hoi polloi of the entire world can go to the Louvre and stare at the Mona Lisa. You want to be able to stand alone in the room with the Mona Lisa, right? And so if you can institute and support programs that you know will not hinder your own ability to go stay at some chateau in Switzerland in the evening yeah. and then fly to Dubai for lunch and then, you know, be in New Zealand by morning, what do you care? You're, you're perfectly happy because all of those spaces will now be open to you. And all of those people that are forced to remain in those spaces will be serving you. Because you uh, have a huge... Yeah. No, I mean, that's certainly a segment of society. Silicon Valley is particularly full of those people. <laughs> the the uh, upper echelons. You know, it's funny because I know a lot of people in Silicon Valley. And if you look at That's their... where we're recording from, essentially, right now. And <laughs> like, <laughs> full disclosure, like, my entire family is in tech. Like brother, uh, sister-in-law, sister, brother-in-law, my dad, my entire extended family is in Israel. Every single one of them is in tech. The next generation is in tech. Yeah, is, yeah. So it's oh. like, these are people that are on paper part of this, this kind of society, but whoever is pulling the strings or the mach or machination creating the machinations has to be at least an order of magnitude more elite because these are not people that I see them as they go through their day to day that have any kind of power. Well, you're describing something that I've noticed even among some nephews and so on. <laughs> they compete with each other. You know, 
I'm getting married in San Marino. I'm getting married in the in Jerusalem. I'm getting married in uh, you know Kuala Lumpur, and they follow each other around to see who has the fanciest wedding. Um, yeah, and you're right. This is not the top of the uh, pyramid. But I'm saying that like my family doesn't even do that, right? It's like my brother got married at a public park last week. Okay. So it's like, got married. Hey, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, we're really, we're we're definitely a lead on that level. Everybody's married. Everybody's still together. So we have that going for us. But I just, I, I feel like people hear about the one percent, and they feel like the one percent must be sitting at the top of the worlds and you know puppeting. And I'm like, one oh, percent. No. I know people that are within the 1%. Sure. And I'm like, these people have no real access puppet to the levers. Puppet master instincts. Not only no puppet master instincts, but they have no access to the levers. Like, we're constantly being throttled by YouTube. Like, we're convinced that there is something that YouTube is doing to our channel to prevent it from getting served to people. Okay. I know people who work at Google, and they're like, I, I, I have no access to anyone at YouTube. Right, so it, it, everything's so compartmentalized. I mean, it's kind of uncanny. Like we'll see videos just take off, like, and then all of a sudden they'll just flatline. Like the the impressions that they're showing to people, it's like it doesn't make any sense. And we have upset YouTube before. They've given us a strike because we had a doctor on that was, you know, she she actually was quite sane, but she just happened to mention some ex some drugs during COVID that you're not supposed to say on YouTube, and that was it. Still aren't allowed to say. Still aren't allowed to say them. Okay. And uh, so I think we got in trouble and uh, we just, I don't know if we'll ever get out of that exactly. So we're only growing by word of mouth. It's, we're not getting the favor of the algorithms. Oh yeah. I mean, I don't know what one does about it. There's something in the United Kingdom called uh, the Global Warming Policy Foundation. And it was uh, founded by Nigel Lawson, who is Maggie Thatcher's uh, Minister of the Exchequer or Treasury Minister. In fact. Um, if you put into Google, Google, GWPF, all you get are desmog and so on, uh, claiming it's uh, illegitimate, it's dishonest, it's corrupt, it's this, it's that, which is sheer nonsense. I mean, it's anything it may not be very effective but i mean you know uh they're very straight on these things uh you have to put in the gwpf this that for google to actually take you there mm. um and they've been trying to figure out what you can do about it and they've never found a solution uh well, yeah because this is this is I know someone who works in search. So they work at Google and their job is to make sure that the search results work properly. And they are isolated from whoever makes the decisions about what is allowed to go into search. Like it's so compartmentalized within the company that the people who are working on it are working oh. downstream of whatever order is in place for what kind of search results can surface. Weird. It's super weird. I mean, the only the only silver lining I can see is that it just becomes so idiotically and obviously broken that you can't actually find the things that you want to find and somebody else steps up and fills the void. Well, I know. I mean, with my son, who is starting a uh, legal consultancy, and uh, anyone who puts his name into Google just gets all the people attacking me. Oh, no. Oh, wow. I, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, now the, the, there's something that needs reform there, and unfortunately, I don't see where it will come from because the powers that be probably enjoy this I just, immensely. Yeah. How do you deal with being so vilified? I ignore it. I mean, you know, to be honest, I've always enjoyed what I did in terms of the science. And uh, you know, I, I realize at this stage, it's a bad period. But you know, we keep working, keep looking at data, seeing it. You know, and the whole business of 
one of the things this has stopped, you know, the question of climate is an interesting one. Uh, what you may not realize is that uh, almost all the work on climate, not that there was a lot of it, was devoted to understanding our present climate. Uh, when Ed Lorenz wrote a book on climate, it was called The General Circulation. When von Neumann had a meeting in the early 50s on climate, it, it was dealing with the present climate what accounts for it uh you have something called the uh Köppen classification you know the earth is divided into dozens of climate regimes it isn't that uh, you know we're one climate marching in lockstep uh, you know there are peculiarities i remember once uh, spending a semester at ucla and uh looking at the weather map for the day and the temperature was increasing monotonically from L.A. to uh, Juneau, Alaska. Hmm. And I was wondering if a Martian happened to be visiting it that day and looking at that profile, what would he think about our general circulation, our climate? Uh, you know, the weaponization of it is a kind of horror story, but uh, it doesn't change the fact that there are a lot of good questions. I mean, one, take, yeah. No, do, one do of the. You, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. One of the questions is, you know, just in any given season, you have stationary patterns, uh, forced by the Himalayas and uh, the ocean land temperature difference, and um, they're fairly well defined. And uh, you can use simple models to do a pretty good job of simulating them. But the big climate models can't. They screw it up. Hmm. And the uh, question is why. And part of the reason is actually fairly simple. Um, if you make a simple model, I, I'm going to use the technical word, linearize it. Um, you know, it's much simpler than the full nonlinear equations and so on, but you can solve them more accurately and at higher resolution than you can run the full model. And sometimes that matters more than having everything in the kitchen sink in it, uh, instead having less in it, but resolving it well enough to solve. <laughs> and so, you know, Stationary waves are an interesting problem. We've looked at that models. Tides are another one. I mean, most of the models can do fairly well with them, but not as well as simple calculations. Hmm. So, you know, they're full. But, you know, then the question of uh, the ice ages, which was a lovely problem. And uh, the solution to that, I think, uh, you know, probably has some loopholes in it, was really clever and and stupid at the same time. What I mean by that is the following. Geologists were studying it. And a man called Milankovic, Serbian, 1940, made a very interesting suggestion. Said, look, if you have a glacier in near the North Pole or the Arctic, Every winter, it's going to snow. You're going to accumulate snow. Whether you form a glacier, a major glacier, depends on what happens in the summer. If the summer is cold, the snow will last and add to next summer and ne next winter and next winter and so on. You know, you have thousands of years to build your two, three kilometers of ice. On the other hand, if the summer is too warm and none of the snow that fell in the winter survived, you're not going to get a glacier. And then he noticed that if you look at the incident sunlight in win you know, in summer in the Arctic, let's say 60 degrees north or someplace, that the orbital variations give an immense change in the solar insulation, 100 watts per meter squared. 
which is huge. I mean, with CO2, you're talking about three watts per meter squared, doubling. Mm. And so he said, uh, the orbits should play a major role. And the orbits have various periods, 20,000, 40,000, 100,000. And the glaciation cycles are dominated by 100,000 years, which isn't the strongest forcing. So that's a bit of a puzzle. And these people at Columbia, largely, and uh, Brown, Embry, I don't know if you knew any of these people, uh, had this program climb up to gather all the data they could on it. And they compared ice volume uh, with uh, the Milankovic parameter, insulation at 60 degrees in June, let's say. And they found they shared periodicities, but they didn't line up well. And so people puzzled over that for a while. And then some young people, two young astronomers in Sweden and a guy at Seattle, I realized that the geologists had made a trivial error. They were comparing the insulation in summer with ice volume. They should have compared it with the time rate of change of ice volume. And then the relations were excellent. And so Milankovic is vindicated, and we have a really good idea of what drives the ice ages at least for the last 700,000 years. There are some other questions still. Those are great problems, and yet to publish it, one of them had to write a sentence totally irrelevant that there are no implications of this for the role of CO2. Mm. Well, I think that we might have mentioned this to you, that when we were talking to Gavin Schmidt, who runs uh, the Goddard Space Institute, yeah. That he told us that under no uncertain terms would there ever be another glaciation on Earth. That's nonsense. With a, with a straight face, and I yeah. remember Sh 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 I remember <laughs> Shiloh just short circuiting when that. Yeah, happened. it was such nonsense. I literally didn't know what to say. I was just like, I mean, oh. you, you know, the whole history of Goddard Institute for Space Studies is pretty weird. Do you know what the history is? Not very you, well. I think you mentioned something, but I, if you could recount the story for for our listeners, that'd be awesome. <laughs> I don't know how much trouble I'll get into, for, but no, I mean, it was started, uh, had to be the end of the 50s, early 60s. Uh, there was at Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, uh, a young scientist at the time, Bob Jastro, and he was considered uh, very valuable to them. I, uh, and uh, he wanted to be near his mother. And she was in New York. And he actually got them to set up a satellite lab, Goddard Institute for Space Studies in New York, near Columbia. And um, it did pretty well for a while. It had uh, a fairly large staff. It had... Uh, and, you know, it was very popular with the people at Harvard and MIT because uh, all of us consulted there. And, uh, you know, had a few people who were expert, but mainly in astrophysics. The meteorology depended very heavily on just doing what a man called Jules Charney was asking them to do. He was at MIT, close friend. And uh, all went well. Um, and then uh, Jastro left uh, under a variety of circumstances, but that's irrelevant. I, he ended up at Dartmouth, I think. And uh, Greenbelt used that occasion to want to bring GIS, Goddard Institute of Space Studies, back to Greenbelt, Maryland. And so they brought people back, and most of them ended up back in Greenbelt. But a handful did not want to leave New York. And uh, Jim Hansen was pretty much the leader of that group. And uh, that led to the usual infighting. 
and NASA cut their funding. And uh, Jim had a good friend, Michael Oppenheimer, who was, I believe, the Barbara Streisand scientist at Environmental Defense Fund. <laughs> and um, he was also on the review panel at EPA for their grants. And he uh, got EPA to replace NASA initially. NASA got back into it after a while at uh, GIS with the provision that they move to climate. So that was already on the agenda very early on, 70s. Um, Jim Hansen had no experience with that. And in fact, his area was planetary, and that's what he used to claim that the Earth was warming due to CO2. But uh, it was something that EPA saw as its future climate. I mean, one thing that was really strange was after we, we stopped recording with Gavin, and I tried, I, I remember asking him a little bit more about this, and he was just like, well, because our entire thesis was, hey, there's a lot of things going on in the environment besides CO2. And he was kind of like, yeah, I know, but I don't want to say that because it's very important that people can only understand one thing at a time. And if we divert the attention away from CO2, then we won't be able to motivate the public to greater action, essentially. Yeah, I mean, that's, I've heard that many times. And Gavin, I mean... That's been his career. He replaced Jim, uh, director of that. Um, you know, the only thing I can say is uh, Jim Hansen at least contributed a little to planetary atmospheres. I have never the faintest idea what Gavin has ever commit, committed to, you know, contributed to. He had a really interesting paper called The Silurian Hypothesis. Okay. I wrote it with Adam Frank, and it was about the anthropogenic signatures in geological contexts. And they basically went through, and it was an exploration of what kind of signatures, had there been an advanced civilization on Earth 30 million years ago, would they have left in the rock record? And it was very interesting because they kind of came up with probably not much of one. And they weren't proposing humans 30 million years yeah, ago or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were proposing that if there was some other entity... What would it look happen. like? Yeah, yeah, and they were like, wait, we wouldn't see it at all. And it's really funny because we put we mentioned that to some academics sometimes, the Silurian, and they just they just kind of laugh us off the table. And then we mentioned that it's written by the this NASA head, and they're like, wait, what? And uh, so, yeah, I guess that's that's Gavin. In my, my book, that's Gavin's big contribution. Okay, because I was just looking at his technical stuff otherwise it was every time he spoke at mit it was terrifically boring <laughs> i mean i think that bureaucrats are boring like people that are heads of institutions are kind of boring because they have a line they have to maintain the line they can't be very curious they can't be very open it just they have become a figurehead and a mascot for an idea and they're really just looking for people to slot into that idea at the end of the day. Yeah, like we come across this all the time because we talk to people that are heads of institutions and there's a lack of, cur there's a marked lack of curiosity that comes with that position that we don't really see anywhere else. Do you ever run into people uh, at GIS or elsewhere who you invite who say, I don't want to speak? Oh my goodness! Yeah, tons. We yeah. I mean, it's more often that they'll they'll say sure, and then it just never happens. But okay. yeah, essentially. Yeah, I mean, I know I have student I have one student who works at GIS, and you know he he doesn't get involved in this, but clearly he can't speak out on it either. Yeah, that's, I mean, that, so for people that are lower down in the institutions, we try to always get people that are sitting in directorate positions just because they seem like they have. Yeah, the, you don't want to hurt some. And they have outreach Yeah, yeah that's why the emeritus professors are the best, because they got nothing to lose. <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely true. Yeah. I mean, I guess to kind of wrap this down, do you have hope that, do you have a hope that 
some point people will see the light because it oh, seems yeah. like that's one of the most painful things. Like one of my dear friends is working on a very controversial topic in solar physics mm-hmm. and he's period he's oscillates between optimism that people will see the light maybe after he's dead and oh my god all my life's work is just going to get paved over in the history books i just wonder how how you perceive that in your own space i uh, you know how shall i put it uh one thing i'm confident of uh all the predictions of doom and gloom will continue to fail mm there's no foundation for them. Even the UN doesn't project them. They're purely out of the political sphere. And so it would be amazing to me that if the science uh, finds no evidence for something, the politicians can foretell it. Um, the models all run too hard. There's one actual possible model that has not and it's from russia and nobody quite knows what's in it Mm. um so you know that part i'm not worried about and the rest would be vanity i mean you know it'd be nice if somebody looks it up and says yeah there were people who are saying this is how it worked and they were mostly right and maybe wrong but you know with anything uh you expect that uh, things will be modified, understanding will be modified. So I, I wouldn't pretend that uh, you have a final solution to anything. Uh, but on the other hand, there are plenty of things in which uh, we've discovered things that are almost certainly have gotten the gist of things. And uh, I mentioned earlier, and I I think it's still important, we have a few minutes, the business of making errors is is hugely downplayed. And it's terribly important that one be free to make mistakes and rectify them. And so, for instance, I remember early on looking at resonance as a possibility for something called blocking. This student was K.K. Tum. And then, you know, while working on tides and doing it in a basic state that was realistic, I realized it was almost impossible to achieve resonance because resonance depends on waves bouncing up and down in phase and amplifying. And every surface it bounces off on the earth is uh, curved. And, uh, you know, not just regularly curved, but irregularly curved. And so every wave bounces, but it never comes back quite in the same place. And Mm -hmm. resonance is a non-starter. And uh, so, you know, that leaves you wary of anything that proposes resonance. Uh, So, you know, maybe you wasted your time looking for resonances in simple systems. Uh, You know, that's one of the things you have to do. then it came to an issue of uh, the bands of Jupiter. And uh, again, the question arose, I mean, was there a resonance? <laughs> and, you know, it, it pays to be skeptical of your own ideas and the experience gives you that. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's one of the things Adam Mastriani talked about too, which was really fascinating, is he thinks science is really a strong link problem. Like the best ideas are going to surface. It doesn't, we spend so much time fretting over bad science and like, you know, people faking data and all this stuff. And he's like, look, it just doesn't really matter. Like those people aren't getting in the way. Those bad studies that people can't reproduce, they just, you could just move on and just forget about it. The things that are really successful are the people who can iterate and figure out what is actually happening. And that's what actually drives progress forwards. And so this, you know, obsession with gatekeeping and, 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 keeping out these bad actors and stuff is really not as big of an issue as it, as it seems. Well, like. it's a big issue for young people, I think. I don't think anyone who is, you know, working these days or is untenured is free to express their views. Yeah. And so there'll be the question, uh, who's going to bring up 
a generation that follows. And I think we're doing real damage to that. Mm. Uh, certainly we're giving young people the wrong idea of what science is. Well, I mean, something that I, I often think about in context of something like the fear over climate change is that, or honestly, any bad idea that people really latch onto, I think that the most effective method for dealing with it is finding the grain of truth in it so that you can make the compromise moving forward of you're worried about this in the wrong way, but there is something in here that you should be worried about. And this is how we can actually deal with it. What if there's nothing to worry about? Well, so I, think I mean, <laughs> taking care of your own backyard, right? Like not, you know, not dumping trash in your backyard, not, oh, sure. not keeping like the car turned on, in your garage at all times. No, like there's, no. there's very obvious things. That but you know, even that's subjective. I remember when we moved to our neighborhood and it was still a working class neighborhood. And, uh, people were a you know, mix of all sorts. And I uh, decided to put in my law, put in a lawn. And, uh, it, you know, it wasn't just, for some reason, I felt like doing it. And uh, neighbors would complain. Hmm. Why are you doing this? <laughs> we we'll all get stuck with it. Now it's the opposite. My lawn looks awful. And the neighbors are stuck <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think that there is a very real concern about rampant chemical contamination, especially in major urban areas. Like we live in, uh, we live up in, in Southern Oregon, but we come back down to the Bay. And for example, there's this island in the middle of the Bay called Treasure Island. Yeah. Treasure Island used to be a military base. Now it's housing. It's, it's largely affordable housing and section eight housing. And you, it's, a, it's an incredibly contaminated site with radioactive contamination, with military base contamination, everything that you can imagine. And there's not really a huge effort to clean it up or to mediate it because it's expensive and it's difficult. And I just feel like industrial civilization tends to build these things up over well, long periods well, well, of time. But, but be a little bit fair on that. Overall in the U.S., do you think we're cleaner now than we were in 1945? It would be... From what we can see. I mean, it, it's very obvious. Rivers are you not catching fire. Yeah, if you travel to, like, I, we were down in Guatemala City a few years ago, and it's like, oh, man, this is what unchecked pollution actually looks like. I mean, it was terrible, like, terrible, like, you couldn't walk I mean, down the street. Compare, you know, Pittsburgh today sure. with Pittsburgh in the 50s. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, all sorts of areas. Uh, you know, that there are still problems, sure. But in general, air quality is better. And it's so much better that we start worrying about PM 2.5 when there's no evidence it does any harm. Mm. Do you have any closing words of wisdom or, or you know, put a bow on this <laughs> for us? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, uh, I, I, I think, you know, what you're doing is good. Inquiry is the foundation of understanding anything. Uh, you can't start out with the answer and uh, then pay everyone to find the answer you've decided on. This is outrageous. And yet that's what we're doing at this point. Uh, when you have claims that, you know, thousands of people all agree on this. Well, first of all, you check out, you find out what they agree on isn't what you're saying. But even if it were, it would be a disaster. And so if we want progress in science, you have to start out with opening it up. You know, interestingly, with the climate issue, the one department of government that tried to uh, play fair was the Department of Energy. And they initially tried to support both sides in order to have some competition of ideas. Um, but by the end of, uh, the nineties, they could no longer sustain that. 
government. And they helped me in one respect. I had a grant from them, and uh, the grant ran out, but, I, you know, the time ran out, but I still had money left. And they let me keep that until I ran out of money. So that allowed me to continue going a few more years and supporting a student or something like that. But uh, the notion that you start out with the answer is just crazy. Yeah, and I actually think it's a really good sign that people are interested in really long conversations like this all of a sudden. It's uh, the if, ability... If YouTube allows it. <laughs> yeah, well, Spotify. Honestly, YouTube's just one of many platforms that we're on, okay. so I'm not too worried about it. I just like to pick on YouTube because I think they have a really nasty monopoly on these things, but... I don't know. I mean, people, the, the general interest in nuanced conversation is actually really exciting because it means that people learned what they learned in school. It wasn't good enough for them. They, they sensed that they were being fed a sort of pre-chewed idea and they wanted to get into the meat of it. And a lot of the people who listen to the show, you know, they're not scientists, right? I mean, there certainly are scientists who listen to the show, but a lot of the people are just doing their job and they're really interested in how nature works. And they want to hear more in depth. And I think that's a really good sign. It's not just our podcast, but there's some really big, long form podcasts that are taken off. I think I, I really even you. overwhelming traditional media at this point. One of the biggest podcasts in the world is way bigger viewership than CNN or, or Fox or something Who like that. Who are you that. thinking of? Short Rogan. Peterson? I'm thinking of Rogan. Joe Rogan's odd Rogan. audience oh, is, yeah. is uh, dwarfing uh, legacy oh, media. Yeah. And that's a Absolutely. really cool sign, actually, regardless of what you think of Joe Rogan. And I, I think that's a really, really good sign for civilization, actually. He went People to are Newton, interested in went the Went to Newton South High School. Hmm. I mean, no, he's a local from here. Yeah. No, it, he's an interesting figure. And uh, he does a good job, I think, of keeping neutral. I think he's just curious. I mean, yeah. that's that's honestly what, like... That's what drives us. That's the only reason we're here is we're just trying to learn more and we're going to bring people along for the ride. And, and I think that that's what people respond to. That's what I respond to anyways. What's interesting is that neutral at this point is basically tarred and feathered as far right. Like there's so many think pieces that about Peterson, about Rogan, about anybody who's yeah. not towing the line of these people are dangerous, you can't talk to them, they're spreading bad information, oh, yeah. they're destroying the fabric of society, and that's just that's just a terrifying thing to be on the sidelines But it's for. not working, that's what's yeah. really cool about yeah. it, yeah. That's what gives me hope, it's like, they're still <laughs> crushing it, you know, they're, yeah. they're, those people that are making those stories up are the ones whose media outlets are dying, mm. and so it makes perfect sense that they would be lashing out. Well, yeah, the internet, I mean, in general, I mean, when you hear about people having uh, multi-million viewers, uh, I mean, you know, essentially uh, to have your papers read by uh, 370 people in a month <laughs> makes you the most read person in your department. Right. Uh, it's a different world. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I hope that we have the opportunity to continue talking to you in the future as you keep yeah. working on stuff. I just should be fun. Good. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for bye all your bye. hard work too. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Have a great rest of your day. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. -bye.